Greetings. Welcome to Bhaktiville. This is Dasi Lane, and I'm here with Bhakti Mimulas, our tech expert. And today we thought we would just, we would celebrate Srila Prabhupada's appearance day by reading from the Lila Mrita. The Lila Mrita is a collection of memories by different devotees compiled by Satsvari Badas. It's a quite wonderful book um, because it's all these different people talking about their experience from their perspective. It's a great book. So I'm going to read from chapter 8 called Planting the Seed, and I'm going to kind of skip around in there, uh, but that's what I'm going to be reading today. I also have some photos that I took uh, from the internet, and some of them are screenshots from a movie, which is a great little movie about happiness on 2nd Avenue, I think it's called. You can look it up on YouTube. It's a great little, great little video, and you can see all the things that are going on. Prabhupada walking from his apartment through the courtyard into the matchless gifts on 26 Second Avenue, and the devotees chanting Hare Krishna. It's really quite wonderful. All right. So first, before we begin, let me offer my respectful obeisances under His divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada who is very dear to Lord Krishna, having taken shelter at his lotus feet. Our respectful obeisances are unto you, O spiritual master, servant of Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Goswami. You are kindly preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya Dev and delivering the Western countries, which are filled with impersonalism and voidism. Today is also called Nandutsva, or Nandotsva, and it's the day that um, Nanda Maharaj celebrates uh, Krishna's appearance with all, all the festival uh, things, you know, giving away of cows and a big feast and lots of people and bathing ceremony and all that stuff, Nandu stuff. So that's also today. All right, planting the seed. So at the beginning of this chapter, there's a little quote uh, from a dialogue with Hayagriva. Hayagriva and Prabhupada are speaking back and forth. Hayagriva says, does what you told us this morning, Howard asked, mean we are supposed to accept the spiritual master to be God? And Prabhupada replied calmly, that means he is due the same respect as God, being God's representative. Then he's not God, I agree with this. No, Prabhupada said, God is God. The spiritual master is his representative. Therefore, he is as good as God, because he can deliver God to the sincere disciple. Is that clear? It's a nice quote. August 1966, it was makeshift, a storefront turned temple and a two-room apartment transformed into the guru's residence and study, but it was complete nonetheless. It was a complete monastery amid the city slums. The temple, the storefront, was quickly becoming known among the hip underground of the Lower East Side. Courtyard was a strangely peaceful place for aspiring monks, with its little garden, bird sanctuary, and trees squeezed in between the front and rear buildings. The Swami's back room was the inner sanctum of the monastery. Each room had a flavor all its own, or rather, it took on its particular character from the Swami's activities there. So the picture that's on the slide viewer right now is the front of the temple, matchless gifts and people walking in. The temple room was his kirtan and lecture hall. The lecture was always serious and formal, even from the beginning, when there was no dyes. He had to sit on a straw mat facing a few guests. It was clear he was here to instruct, not to invite casual give-and-take dialogue. 
questions had to wait until he finished speaking. The audience would sit on the floor and listen for 45 minutes as he delivered the Vedic knowledge intact, always speaking on the basis of Vedic authority, quoting Sanskrit, quoting the previous spiritual masters, delivering perfect knowledge supported with reason and argument. While contending with noises of the street, he lectured with exacting scholarship and deeply committed devotees. It appeared that he had long ago mastered all the references and conclusions of his predecessors and had even come to an anticipate all intellectual challenges. He also held, held kirtans in the storefront. Like the lectures, the kirtans were serious they were not so formal. Prabhupada was lenient during kirtans. Visitors would bring harmoniums, wooden flutes, guitars, and they would follow the melody or create their own improvisations. Someone brought an old string bass and bow. An inspired guest could always pick up the bow and play along. Some of the boys had found the innards of an upright piano waiting on the curb with someone's garbage, and they had brought it to the temple and placed it near the entrance. During a kirtan, freewheeling guests would run their hands over the wires, creating strange vibrations. Robert Nelson, several weeks back, had brought a large symbol that now hung from the ceiling, dangling close by the Swami's dies. Let's see what's the next picture on the slideshow. I think I have a picture of Prabhupada sitting. So this is this picture is Srila Prabhupada walking out of his apartment in the back through the courtyard which connected to the, the matchless gifts and here he is walking in to the temple. This is what his lectures look like. The store was, was very narrow. Um, but the devotees are all sitting there and listening. All right, I'll keep going. But there was a limit to the extravagance. Sometimes when a newcomer picked up the cartels and played them in a beat other than the standard one, two, three, Swamiji would ask one of the boys to correct him, even at the risk of offending the guest. Prabhupada led the chanting and drummed with one hand on a small bongo. Even on this little bongo drum, he played Bengali Murdunga rhythms, so interesting that a local conga drummer used to come just to hear. Swami gets in some good licks. So. Swami's kirtans were a new high, and the boys would glance at each other with widening eyes and shaking heads as they responded to his chanting comparing it to their previous drug experiences and signaling each other favorably. This is great. It's better than LSD. Hey man, I'm really getting high on this. And Prabhupada encouraged their newfound intoxication. As maestro of these kirtans, he was also acting expertly as guru. Lord Chaitanya had said, there are no hard and fast rules for chanting the holy name. Prabhupada brought the chanting to the Lower East Side just that way. The kindergarten of spiritual life, he once called the temple. Here he taught the ABCs of Krishna consciousness, lecturing from Bhagavad Gita, and leading the group chanting of Hare Krishna. Sometimes after the final kirtan, he would invite those who were interested to join him for further talks in his apartment. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the back room of his apartment, Prabhupada was usually alone, especially in the early morning hours, 2, 3, and 4 a.m., when almost no one else was awake. In these early hours, in his, his room was silent, and he worked alone in the intimacy of his relationship with Krishna. He would sit on the floor behind his suitcase desk, worshiping Krishna by typing the translations and purports of his Srimad Bhagavatam. But the same back room was also used for meetings, and anyone who brought himself to knock on Swami's door 
could enter and speak with him at any time face to face. Prabhupada would sit back from his typewriter and give his time to talking, listening, answering questions, sometimes arguing or joking. The visitor might sit alone with him for half an hour before someone else would knock and Swamiji would invite the newcomer to join them. New guests would come and others would go, but Swamiji stayed and sat and talked. Generally, visits were formal. His guests would ask philosophical questions and he would answer, much the same as after a lecture in the storefront. But occasionally, some of the boys who were becoming serious followers would monopolize his time, especially on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. And there was no evening lecture in the temple. Often they would ask him personal questions. What was it like when he first came to New York? What about India? Did he have followers there? Were his family members devotees of Krishna? What was his spiritual master like? And then Prabhupada, Prabhupada would talk in a different way, quieter, more intimate and humorous. He told how one morning in New York, he had first seen snow and thought someone had whitewashed the buildings. He told how he had spoken at several churches in Butler, it's in Pennsylvania. And when the boys asked what kind of churches they were, he smiled and replied, I don't know. And they laughed with him. He would reminisce freely about the British control of India and about Indian politics. He told them it was not so much Gandhi as Subhas Chandra Bose who had liberated India. Subhas Chandra Bose had gone outside of India and started the Indian National Army. He entered into an agreement with Hitler that Indian soldiers fighting for British India who surrendered to the Germans could be returned to the Indian National Army to fight against the British. And it was this show of force by Bose, more than Gandhi's nonviolence, which led to India's independence. He talked of his childhood at the turn of the century when street lamps were gaslit and carriages and horse-drawn trams were the only vehicles on Calcutta's dusty streets. These talks charmed the boys even more than the transcendental philosophy of Bhagavad Gita and drew them affectionately to him. He told about his father, Gaur Mohande, a pure Vaishnava. His father had been a cloth merchant and his family had been intimately related with the aristocratic Mullocks of Calcutta. The Mullocks had a deity of Krishna and Prabhupada's father had given him a deity to worship as a child. He used to imitate the worship of the Govinda deity in the Mullocks temple. As a boy, he had held his own Ratayatra festivals each year imitating in miniature the gigantic festival at Jagannath Puri. And his father's friends used to joke, oh, the Ratayatra ceremony is going on at your home and you do not invite us? What is this? His father would reply, this is child's play, that's all. The neighbor said, oh, child's play? You are avoiding us by saying it's for children? Prabhupada fondly remembered his father, who had never wanted him to be a worldly man, who had given him lessons in Radanga, and who had prayed to visiting sadhus that one day the boy would grow up to be a devotee of Radharani. Mm -hmm. One night he told how he had met his spiritual master. Hang on, let me get some water just a second. Oh, Lenny, Hare Krishna. Nice to see you. All right. One night, he told how he had met his spiritual master. He told how he had begun his own chemical business, but had left home and in 1959 had taken sannyas. The boys were interested, but so ignorant of the things Prabhupada was talking about that at the mention of a word like murdanga or sannyas, 
they would have to ask what it meant. And he would go on conventional tangents, describing Indian spices, Indian drums, even Indian women. And whatever he spoke about, he would eventually shine upon it the light of the Shastra. He did not ration out such talk, but he gave it abundantly by the hour, day after day, as long as there was a real live inquiry. At noon, in the front room, it became a dining hall, and in the evenings, a place of intimate worship. Prabhupada had kept the room with his 12-foot square hardwood parquet floor, clean and bare, the solitary coffee table against the wall, between the two courtyard windows was the only furniture. Daily at noon, a dozen men were now taking lunch here with him. The meal was cooked by Keith, who spent the whole morning in the kitchen. So here they're talking about Prabhupada's quarters. And Keith is Kirtanananda. At first, Keith had cooked only for the Swami. He had mastered the art of cooking dal, rice, and sabji in the Swami's three-tiered boiler, and usually there had been enough for one or two guests as well. But soon more guests had begun to gather, and Prabhupada told Keith to increase the quantity, abandoning the small three-tiered cooker, until he was cooking for a dozen hungry men. The boarders, Raphael, Raphael and Don, though not so interested in the Swami's talk, would arrive punctually each day for prasadam, usually with a friend or two who had wandered into the storefront. Steve would drop by from his job at the welfare office. The Mott Street group would come, and there were others. The kitchen was stocked with standard Indian spices, fresh chilies, fresh ginger root, whole cumin seeds, turmeric, and asafoetida. Keith mastered the basic cooking techniques and passed them on to Chuck, who became his assistant. Some of the other boys would stand at the doorway of the narrow kitchenette to watch Keith as one thick pancake-like chapati after another blew up like an inflated balloon over the open flame and then took its place in the steaming rack. While the fine basmati rice boiled to a moist, fluffy white finish and the sabji simmered, the noon cooking would climax with the chaunts. Keith prepared the chants exactly as Swamiji has shown him. Over the flame, he set a small metal cup, half filled with clarified butter, and then put in cumin seeds. When the seeds turned almost black, he added chilies. And as the chilies blackened, a choking smoke began to pour from the cup. Now the chants was ready. <clears throat> with his cook's tongs, Keith lifted the cup its boiling, crackling mixture fuming like a sorcerer's kettle, and brought it to the edge of the pot of boiling dal. He opened the tight cover slightly, dumped the boiling chance into the dal with a flick of his wrist, and immediately replaced the lid. Pow! The meeting of the chance and the dal created an explosion, which was then greeted by cheers from the doorway, signifying that the cooking was now complete. This final operation was so volatile that it once blew the top of the pot to the ceiling with a loud smash, causing minor burns to keep sand. Some of the neighbors complained of acrid, penetrating fumes. But the devotees loved it. So when I lived in the temple and people would make the chants and this smoke would happen, everybody would just start coughing. And they said, um, that meant that it was a good chance if people were coughing. <laughs> anyway, that's that's how we would spice things. And actually, I would throw the whole chance pan into the pot. I wouldn't pour it in gently. I would just dump it and put the lid on. I'd put the whole thing, the little pot, into the soup and then put the lid on. Anyway, when lunch was ready, Swamiji would wash his hands and mouth in the bathroom and come out into the front room, his soft pink-bottomed feet always bare, his saffron dhoti reaching down to his ankles. He would stand by the coffee table, which held the picture of Lord Chaitanya and his associates, 
while his own associates stood around him against the walls. Keith would bring in a big tray of chapatis, stacked by the dozens, and place it on the floor before the altar table, along with pots of rice, dal, and sabji. Swamiji would then recite the Bengali prayer for offering food to the Lord, and all present would follow him by bowing down knees and head to the floor and approximating the Bengali prayer one word at a time. While the steam and mixed aromas drifted up like an offering of incense for the picture of Lord Chaitanya, the Swami's followers bowed their heads to the wooden floor and mumbled the prayer. So we used to just offer the pots. Instead of putting portions on a plate, we would just take all the pots in. All right, back to the reading. Prabhupada then sat with his friends, eating the same prasadam as they, with the addition of a banana and a metal bowl full of hot milk. He would slice the banana by pushing it downward against the edge of the bowl, letting the slices fall into the hot milk. Prabhupada's open decree that everyone should eat as much prasadam as possible created a humorous mood and a family feeling. No one was allowed to simply sit, picking out his food, nibbling politely. They ate with a gusto Swamiji almost insisted upon. If he saw someone not eating heartily, he would call the person's name and smilingly protest. Why are you not eating? Take prasadam. And he would laugh. When I was coming to your country on the boat, he said, I thought, how will the Americans ever eat this food? The boys pushed their plates forward for more. Keith would serve seconds, more rice, dal, chapatis, and sochi. After all, it was spiritual. You were supposed to eat a lot. It would purify you. It would free you from maya. Besides, it was good, delicious, and spicy. This was better than American food. It was like chanting. It was far out. You got high from eating this food. They ate with the right hand, Indian style. Keith and Howard had already learned this and had even tasted similar dishes. But as they told the Swami and a room of believers, the food in India had never been this good. One boy, Stanley, was quite young and Prabhupada, almost like a doting father, watched over him as he ate. Stanley's mother had personally met Prabhupada and said that only if he took personal care of her son would she allow him to live in the monastery. Prabhupada complied, diligently encouraged the boy until Stanley gradually took on a voracious appetite and began consuming ten chapatis at a sitting and would have taken more had Swamiji not told him to stop. But aside from Swamiji's limiting Stanley to ten chapatis, the word was always more Take more. When Prabhupada was finished, he would rise and leave the room. He would catch a couple of volunteers to help him clean, and the others would leave. Occasionally, on a Sunday, Prabhupada himself would cook a feast with special Indian dishes. Steve, and this is Steve Isatsuru, who compiled this collection of stories. Swamiji personally cooked the prasadam and then served it to us upstairs in his front room. We all sat in rows, and I remember him walking up and down in between the rows of boys, passing before us with his bare feet and serving us with a spoon from different pots. He would ask, what did we want? Did we want more of this? And he would serve us with pleasure. These dishes were not ordinary, but sweets and savories like sweet rice and coat Cotteries with special tastes. Even after we had all taken a full plate, he would come back and ask us to take more. Once he came up to me and asked what I would like more of, would I like some more sweet rice? In my early misconception of spiritual life, I thought I should deny myself what I liked best, so I asked for some more plain rice. But even that plain rice, was fancy yellow rice with fried cheese balls. On the off nights, his apartment was quiet. He might remain alone for the whole evening. 
typing and translating Srimad Bhagavatam. We're talking in a relaxed atmosphere to just one or two guests until 10. But on meeting nights, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, there was activity in every room of his apartment. He wasn't alone anymore. His new followers were helping him, and they shared in his spirit of trying to get people to chant Hare Krishna and hear of Krishna consciousness. In the back room, he worked on his translation of the Bhagavatam, or spoke with guests up until six, when he would go to take his bath. Sometimes he would have to wait until the bathroom was free. He had introduced his young followers to the practice of taking two baths a day, and now he was sometimes inconvenienced by having to share his bathroom. After his bath, he would come into the front room where his assembled followers would sit around him. He would sit on a mat facing his picture of Panchatattva, and after putting a few drops of water in his left palm from a small metal bowl, a metal spoon and bowl, he would rub a lump of Vrindavan clay in the water, making a wet paste. He would then apply the clay markings of Vaishnava Tilak, dipping into the yellowish paste with his, in his left hand with the ring finger of his right. He would scrape wet clay from his palm, and while looking into a small mirror, which he held deftly between his thumb and pinky of his left hand, he would mark a vertical clay strip up his forehead, and then trim the clay into two parallel lines by placing the little finger of his right hand between his eyebrows and running it upward past the hairline, clearing a path in the still moist clay. Then he marked 11 other places on his body while the boy sat observing, sometimes asking questions or sometimes speaking of their own understandings of Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada, my Guru Maharaj used to put on tilak without a mirror. Devotee, did it come out neat? Prabhupada, neat or not neat, that does not matter. Yes, it was also neat, always neat. Prabhupada would then silently recite the Gayatri Mantra, holding his Brahmin sacred thread and looping it around his right thumb. He would sit erect, silently moving his lips. His bare shoulders and arms were quite thin, as his chest, as his chest, as was his chest, sorry. But he had a round, slightly protruding belly. His complexion was as satiny smooth as a young boy's, except for his face, which bore signs of age. The movements of his hands were methodical, aristocratic, yet delicate. He picked up two brass bells in his left hand and began ringing them then lighting two sticks of incense from the candle near the picture of Lord Chaitanya and his associates. He began waving the incense slowly in small circles before Lord Chaitanya, while still ringing the bells. He looked deeply at the picture and continued cutting spirals of fragrant smoke, all the while ringing the bells. None of the boys knew what he was doing, although he did it every evening. But it was a ceremony. It meant something. The boys began to call the ceremony bells. After bells, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, it would usually be time for evening kirtan. Some of the devotees would already be downstairs, greeting guests and explaining about the Swami and the chanting. But without the Swami, nothing could be done. No one knew how to sing or drum, and no one dared think of leading the mantra chanting without him. Only when he entered at seven o'clock could they begin. Freshly showered and dressed in his clean Indian hand-woven cloth, his arms and body decorated with the arrow-like Vaishnava markings, Prabhupada would leave his apartment and go downstairs to face another ecstatic <laughs> opportunity. So, here's we saw this before, but here's this picture. And here he's entering the temple, giving a lecture. And here, after the lecture, 
they would all leave and go out on Sankerton, out into the street. Yes, great pictures. I'm going to turn on my sound so I can hear if you have any questions. Oh, Hamilton is here. All right, well. And we see you on Facebook. Nice to see you here. Yes, they are great pictures. It took a while, there aren't so many out there on the internet these days. So that's the beginning there, the first temple. Questions, comments? You're welcome. All right, all glories to Shiva Prabhupada.